No matter how old we are, we always remember what our dads say and do. My dad is more like Jesus than your dad. Nuh-uh. My dad doesn't let anybody eat any food until we pray for it. My dad prays for one minute every day. You know what? Our church has pancakes. This is what my sister and mom use for their blush. My dad says that mean kids never know what they're talking about. Because their parents don't know what they're talking about either. My dad says to punch meanies in the face. Then my mom says, don't ever do that. And my dad goes to time out. <laughs> <laughs> My dad's beard is itchy whenever he kisses me. My dad takes me to church so we could learn to be just like Jesus. My daddy prays for me. Then he makes me stop talking and go to bed. Then I get a flashlight and read my comic book. That's a sin. He's sinning. No, I'm not. Sinner. No, I'm not. R2. 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 My dad said that if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. My dad never stays mad at me. My dad taught me to forgive, because Jesus forgives us every time we ask. I want a mohawk. I wish I had hair. It's OK. Your hair will probably grow back. Thanks for being our dads for all our lives. How many times have we, as parents, many times we think about being failures? If I can get this off, maybe I won't feel like a failure. <clears throat> So many times we may feel like a failure sometimes as we go through our lives and as our kids grow and we make mistakes. And uh, whether you're a, a dad or a mom or even an aunt or an uncle or a grandpa or a grandma, we all make mistakes. There's only one perfect father, isn't there? And there's only one perfect father, and that perfect father is our Lord. And uh, so he knows that we're going to make mistakes, and yet he still bestows upon us the blessing of giving us a quiver full. I, uh, um, as far as I'm concerned, Adam says he didn't have a quiver full. He had his quiver full, the Lord gave him two. So I'm sure at times he felt like that was a quiver full. <laughs> Just like me with four, normally a quiver, at least nowadays, I think it's about six arrows. And uh, I didn't have mine numerically, but man, I know that I had more than my quiver full. <laughs> but uh, today I didn't get up here to talk about this. I would like you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and verses 1 through 7. This is going to be a very unique text in regards to the message today, because of the fact that today I really want to talk about the character of the character of a godly leader. The character of a godly leader. And I think one of the best places for us to look, especially with our circumstances the way they are for our church at this present time, is we are without a pastor, but we are not without leaders. Praise <coughs> the Lord for that. But we are without a pastor, but uh, we're going to look at in this text, and we're going to see seven verses just in regards to a pastor or a bishop, you'll see. But I'm going to bring you into uh, the context of this and the idea of godly character is much more important in a godly leader. And you'll see in just a minute why I chose to go this route, Lord willing. Let's look here at 1 Timothy chapter 3, and let's start reading with verse 1, down to verse 7. It says, This is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, 
a husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality and to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know uh, not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the reproach and the snare the devil. Let's go to the Lord again in prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you now, Lord, again, so we thank you for this time and for this opportunity. Lord, I'm so thankful for uh, my dad and also uh, the many dads that are represented here, the, uh, the fathers, the grandfathers, even the great-grandfathers. Lord, we ask for that today would be a great day for them, a, a blessed day, Lord, that they may be able to uh, either see or, or talk to uh, their family and that there would be fellowship there. And for those that have lost their dads. We ask, Lord, that today and this Father's Day, Lord, that you would comfort them as well during this time. No doubt it's a very difficult time, just as it was for mothers and missing out their mothers. But, Lord, we do also know, Lord, that fathers are a good example or can be an example of what to do and what not to do. We ask, Lord, that you would lead, guide, and direct in this message. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right. God has appointed us as men to be the leaders of our homes. Now, I know that that's very uh, uh, debatable today in this world, what that leadership looks like. But leadership is more than just giving orders. And that's never what the Lord gave as re in regards to a leader. It's much more than just expecting everyone in our home to listen to us because we are leaders. I would ask uh, how many of you as parents have said, uh, you've given a command to your kids and they would say why, and I'm not going to ask how many have said this, but you can take it into account yourself because I said so, right? I remember my parents have said that and I remember me saying that and I kind of chuckle when I hear my kids say it to their kids. Right? And uh, there is a certain regard of truth to that because we are the authority figure, but leaders don't lead by just barking orders. It makes uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21 all the way through to Ephesians 6 and verse 4, it makes it very clear what God expects of us as leaders. He expects us to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. He sacrificed himself for his church. Men, that's how we're to do. We are also to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And nurture is described as instruction with aims at increasing virtue. The word admonition means to influence someone by words or advice. This is not commands. This is not orders. This isn't because I told you so, but this is because you have an influence. If we ever hope to have this kind of leadership, we must have character. Character is something that many, and I've had uh, this before, I've had people uh, uh, laugh at me when I talk about character. Character is the kind of person that when it's in the middle of the night or real early in the morning, 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock, I know some get up and go to work real early in the morning, and you're sitting at a red light, there's no other cars around, and you say, okay, do I step and wait for this red light or do I go through? Character says that we would wait for the light to go through. How many times is it that you may be at the grocery store and the, and the uh, cashier has given you more change uh, back than what you have, uh, uh, what you are in need of? 
Character says that you would go back and give that extra change back. That's character. It's not something to scoff at. It's not something to laugh at. It's not something to make fun of. And you say that those are trivial things. No, it's not. Because character speaks to the whole person. Now, although I'm focusing this more <coughs> to men today, as fathers, I believe it still goes for all. So character, I believe, comes from, first of all, I believe it comes from convictions. It comes from convictions. A person's convictions reveal how they spend their money, how they spend their time, how they spend their efforts. Does it not? We see that all the time. Ephesians chapter 6, uh, uh, six and verses 6 and 8 says, Not with thy service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God with the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good things, whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bound or free. I've heard it said that uh, people say that they can uh, get along with anybody. They can blend in with the crowd. They can be as it is a chameleon. You know, the Lord never called us to be chameleons. The Lord called us to be those of distinction, those of convictions, those with character. Many people do extraordinary things. I like to watch uh, uh, programs. My uh, family kind of laughs at me because of the fact that uh, at least uh, Hannah does many times. Um, uh, and it's not because she's making fun of me. She just knows it's something she can count on for me. I usually watch on a television. I don't watch a whole lot of television. But what I do watch is I watch a bunch of YouTube. And I also like to watch uh, uh, another program, which is all documentary. All right? There are two different channels, and it's off of the internet, so um, I enjoy that. And the reason why I say that is because on both of those, I watch people of great character that have set themselves up for very specific goals, and they achieve them. I like to watch these people, and I, I, I told you before, I like bikes. I like riding bikes, and I watch people that ride 300 miles. In 20, uh, not in 24 um, days, but in less than three days. Over 300 miles in less than three days on a bike with no rest, many of them. They may stop to rest for one hour or two hours. They are self supporting, so they, if they have to eat, they stop. And I've seen, I've watched one uh, young lady, she had on her bike, she had a pouch that was on her uh, front bar here in the front, and she was shoving McDonald's hamburgers and dumping french fries in with salt all over it, and she was eating that as she's riding her bike. How many of you have ever, have you ever heard of endurance marathons? Endurance marathons are 100 miles. People are running a hundred miles. Now, some of it they walk, obviously, but they're going for that long. That's incredible to me. It just is incredible. But I like to watch those things. Think about people that do incredible or very extraordinary things. Let's think about climbing uh, mountains like Mount Everest at 29,029 feet above sea level. When you get up to a certain level, you have to have oxygen in order to just be able to breathe because the air is so thin. Hiking the Appalachian Trail, which starts down in Georgia and goes all the way up into Maine. It is uh, uh, estimated at 2,200 miles and takes the through hiker somewhere around the time period of six to seven months to do this. Starting a company and seeing it grow to a multi-billion dollar company with thousands of employees over the whole world. Playing a good character in a movie or a drama type uh, program. However, these things don't speak to the complete character of the individual. Those are incredible things, but it doesn't speak to the whole 
person's convictions also reveal how they talk about themselves, how they talk about their church, and also how they talk to and about others. What would people say about you and how you talk? How do you talk about your church? Do you agree with everything that goes on? You might not agree with what I have to say when I preach. And that's all right. Are you going to go and explain that to people outside the church that don't have the same understanding or the context of what that is? Are you going to complain about how things are conducted? What is it that you say about people and about others? When they tell you secrets, do you tell those secrets to somebody else? When they ask you clearly not to say anything? A person's convictions reveal how they'll talk about themselves to other people, their church, and also to and about others. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 18, it says, But those things which we see out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. Pretty tough words, isn't it? So we not only see that our character comes from convictions, but our character is not just a private matter. Many times people like to think that my life just doesn't affect anybody else. It doesn't reflect, it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't affect you. What my choices and what my life does only affects me. I'm sorry, but according to Scripture, it's a little bit different and a little bit more than that. And we can see examples of that. Let's just take a couple of examples from God's Word. David's lapse in character resulted in his sin with Bathsheba. Now uh, let's just think about the idea. Not only did it affect Bathsheba, but that sin resulted in an extramarital sin, as we've already uh, alluded to. It resulted in the death of Uriah by David's hand in the fact of telling them to withdraw, putting him in the front withdraw. It resulted in the death of a child that was a result of their extramarital affair. And it resulted in an internal battle between David and his son Absalom, which ultimately ended in Absalom's life. Now you tell me, did David's sin affect just him? His lack of character? That's tough. Let's do another one. Lot's lapse in his character affected his testimony publicly as well. He suffered, uh, or he offered his virgin daughters to the evil men outside the door in Genesis chapter 19 and verse 8, as they were wanting the angels that came and brought themselves to Lot. As Lot went to warn his sons-in-laws in Genesis chapter 19 and verse 14, he seemed as one that mocked him unto his son-in-laws, the scripture says. Lot lost his wife with the compromise of his character as well when she turned and to look back and turned into a pillar of salt. Let's not get too far down on Lot, though, because the show, well, let's go on, and actually before we finish, because that really wasn't all of the ramifications of Lot and his lack of character. And then to show the implication of his lapse of character, Lot's two daughters got him drunk and got him pregnant by their father, and uh, he did not even know that this happened. Both daughters gave birth to two different nations, Moab and the uh, Ammonites, in Genesis chapter 19, and verses 38 and 39, and both of those nations were enemies of God. Yet, I say yet, in the New Testament, Lot is referred to in 2 Peter chapter 2, and verses 7 and 8, and delivered just Lot. That wasn't he was delivering just Lot. Just is another name for righteous. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for the righteous man dwelleth among them in 
seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Lot was offended. Lot was, as it says in the scripture, not only uh, was that righteous man, he was willing among them, he was vexed in his righteousness, but that affected that affected his family, did it not? We also know that based on David, you know, some might say, well, David must have been never saved. Well, the New Testament refers to David as one after God's own heart. So there is a silver lining in all of this that the Lord can still use you as a man, even though you make a mistake. He can use you as a woman as well, even though your mistake is there. Just understand that a lack of character has its effects on others. Character rubs all. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33, Be not deceived, evil communication corrupt with good manners. Also we see uh, in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 6, Wisdom compels people in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 6 to forsake the foolish and live and go in the way of understanding. We also see in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 20, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Character rubs off. How many times have we as parents, or even our parents, have told us, you can't bring people up, they'll bring you down. They don't intentionally try to do that, but what's happening is we try and blend in with those that are around us that don't have the same beliefs, they don't have the same character, they don't have the same drive, they don't have the same desires in their hearts as born-again Christians. And what's going to happen? They're going to bring him down. <clears throat> also, character is something that's proven over time. Character is not something that all of a sudden you can wake up and say, okay, I've apologized, I made this right, now you need to believe me, you need to trust me, and you need to listen to what I have to say. Character is proven over time. And there's biblical examples of that as well, starting with our Lord and Savior Jesus. Jesus proved over time that he was the Savior as prophesied. Did he really need that proof? Did he really need to do that? But he showed in his life. No, he didn't need to, but he showed in his life over time that he had the proper kind of character and was proven over time. John chapter 21 and verses 24 through 25. This is the disciple which testified of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony, that was the testimony of Jesus Christ, is true, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose, and even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. That's how the book of John is concluded. We also see that Paul also was accused, and they could not convict him either. Why? Because his convictions, his uh, character was proven over time. Acts chapter 25, and verses 6 through 8. And when he had tarried among them for uh, the ten days, he went down unto Caesarea. And the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought. And when he was come, the Jews, which came down from Jerusalem, stood round about and laid uh, many and grievous complaints against Paul which they could not prove, while he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar, have I offended anything <coughs> at all. Why? Because he proved his character over time. So, why in the world would I pick 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7 to bring about this text. Again, as I mentioned, our church is looking for 
a pastor. The pulpit committee, when they get together, this is our number one text we use to be able to bring forth or call a man to be able to pastor or even candidate. We don't call, but we end up offering up a candidate for the church. And the reason why I say that, men are, to be, to, uh, men are declared, as I mentioned already, to be the heads of their household. Just as a pastor is the leader of this church. Now understand that Christ is the head. But the pastor is the under-shepherd that orchestrates being able to lead, guide, and direct how the Lord leads that man and leads this church. This text here, 1 Timothy, although it addresses the office of a bishop, commonly referred to as pastor elder, this also can be used to describe the role of a godly man. Let's think about it. The three points that I brought forth, one is character comes from conviction. The text says that a pastor or a bishop is to be blameless, means above reproach. A man's character reveals a particular type of man, does it not? The husband of one wife is much more than not divorced. It means that he is a one-woman man. Another woman does not capture his attention other than his wife sexually or even emotionally. And that means even by pornography, pictures, anything else. Husbands, your focus is to be your wife. Not another woman. I also believe that according to the scripture, it says vigilant. Vigilant is sober-minded. This means to have their wits about them. Also, it means that it means that, that man needs to be self-controlled. Doesn't need to be blowing up at a moment's notice when things aren't going his way. I have a, a video, and I haven't showed it yet. Maybe someday I will, of... Uh, one of my grandsons. And uh, you know what? He's no different than any of the rest of us. And uh, he, uh, and I threatened to do this, and I just finally had a wonderful opportunity that he didn't get his way. And you know what he did? He threw himself down on the ground. And when he threw himself down on the ground, he's laying there, and he's smacking his heel against the ground. And then all of a sudden, he starts banging his head up against the ground. And he starts hitting his fist up against the ground. Why? All of that was because of the fact that he didn't get what he wanted. Tell me, is there anybody in here that's a little bit different than that? Because when we don't get what we want, what do we do as adults? We pout. We give the silent treatment. We stop coming to church, because after all, that Matt Brooks character, he's just meddling. We do all kinds of things. What kind of character do we have? Character starts to come, and it stems from our convictions. Are we exercising self-control? Character is not just a private matter, as I mentioned before. Uh, according to this, the bishop or the pastor is to be hospitable, welcoming, fun to be around. I believe that's part of hospitality as well. I mean, good grief. How many times, how many of us want to be around somebody that's a downer all the time? I don't like being around a downer. I'm a one up and a downer. I don't need another one to be around. Right? But when we start looking at that, he's hospitable. Men, are we hospitable in our house? Are we hospitable towards our wives? Are we hospitable towards our children, our grandchildren? Lord knows sometimes we don't feel like being hospitable. But yet, do we love? Do we care? 
We also see that the bishop and the pastor is apt to teach, is to have a desire and are skilled for in their ability to communicate their convictions. This is raising up children and the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Not a striker, it's not a brawler or looking for a fight. I heard it said that if you have 24 targets but only 12 bullets, you better choose your battles. I think that's very true. You know, I, I can tell you that in my marriage this year, I think it's 33 years. I don't know why I looked over at Scott and Kelly. <laughs> but they got married at the same time, and Robin and Amy as well, same year. 33 years of marriage. It took me quite some time to get to the point where I learned that I don't have enough bullets in my gun to fight all the battles. And some battles just aren't worth waiting. And you know what? I never, I never, and I can tell you this honestly, I never struck my wife. But I believe this brawler is much more than just a striker. Because how many times is it that we strike with our words? That goes for you ladies as well. All of us have that. All of us do. No strikers, not a brawler, not looking for a fight. How many times you wake up on the edge of the bed and it's just like, oh man, today is one of those days. Don't cross me or I'll break down my book. <laughs> like that really means anything to me. <laughs> I've been written in a lot of books. <laughs> and character is proven over time. Again, scripture, according to the bishop and the pastor, not greedy of filthy lucre. He understands that there is a need for income to be provided for their family, but is not consumed by it. Ruleth well his household, does not, uh, uh, does not entitle a man to sit back and bark orders. It means that he is to be a superintendent or a manager of his own house. A manager leads by example. A manager understands that this is not my house. It's entrusted to me from God to lead this house. Also, we see that it's a novice, it's a newbie. Or a newborn Christian. How does that, or, or even a, a newly called preacher. How does that pertain? Well, listen. Us men don't need to be acting like children. We need to behave like men. We need to act like men. And I believe that according to this text as well, that we have a good report of them which are without. That is referring to the idea is having an exceptional character, so much so in their character, to where it's beyond reproach, even out in the world. Those that know you that aren't on the same path as you will say, man, he's a man or a woman of character. They're people I can trust. They're people I can count on. That's a pretty heavy load, isn't it? Now we've seen some very important people in our text today, and in our message, we've seen David, and we've seen um, a lot, we've seen Paul, we've seen Jesus. Of course, Jesus is the perfect one, right? Because that's pretty much uh, understood, right? Because he was perfect. How else could he pay for our sins unless he was perfect? So that's a no-brainer, right, in many people's minds. But man, I, I don't, how can, this is a pretty tall order. Yeah, it is. That's why we need Jesus Christ as our leader. Not my helper, but my leader. My leader. Turn with me, if you will, please, to one last text. Let's turn over to James chapter 3. James chapter 3.
I actually thought about changing my text for this message to this one, but I, I went against it. But I want to leave you with this text. James chapter 3, verses 13 down through to verse 18. Now, uh, keep in mind that James is being addressed to those that are born again Christians, very specifically, I believe, Jews, but uh, I believe that it goes for us as well even today. But notice what it says here, James chapter 3, starting with verse 13. It says, Who is a wise man and dude with uh, knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Now, before we get too far, I want to explain to you what that word conversation is. That word conversation is not what you verbally say, but it is your actions. It is action. This is how you are when nobody else is looking. This is your character, folks. How is it that you're being viewed? Let him show out of a good conversation or good character, good manner of life, good works, his works with meekness of wisdom. But if he have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. I'll be the first one to tell you that I am not perfect in being able to execute all of what this scripture says or even what I said in my message. I have fallen many times. And if my kids uh, would take the time to explain to you, I'm sure they have a long laundry list and each one would probably be different for what they remember. My wife could probably have a longer one. But the fact of the matter is, is that the Lord said that he forgive me. And in forgiving me, I would go back and ask them for forgiveness. And you know what? I've had to do that many times. And you know what? The Lord still works with me. Men, you may be failing. You may have failed, and you're probably going to fail some more. I'm not giving you carte blanche to do whatever you want to do because the Lord's going to forgive you. I'm telling you that your Lord, your Savior, same Lord, same Savior for me, will forgive you. And if you ask Him for leadership and guidance, you will be able to do as it says in here. And you will be men of character. Will your character be scarred from time to time? Yes, it will, but you can rebuild your character. It takes time. Does it not? It takes time. All right, let's stand.